Help us to hear and respond as we hear these words from the Gospel of John. After these things leads us to wonder what things. Well, here we are at uh, just following the discovery of the resurrection. Jesus has appeared to the disciples on two occasions, and that's what these things are that John is referring to. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. <clears throat> Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him what all of us would say, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, bring some fish that you may, sorry, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. But now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. May these words be for us a word of God for all of us people of God. When I was 18 years old, I wanted to be a marine biologist. How many of you, when you were younger, wanted to be a marine biologist? Yeah, a few of you. After touring colleges all across the United States, I decided to go to Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. That August, I arrived in Florida to take my first marine biology class, Estuarian Ecology. Well, I thought I'd be studying incredible sharks, amazing fish, and the mysteries of the ocean. Instead, I found myself immersed in the muck of Tampa Bay, analyzing seagrass. Standing in 115 degree heat, pulling up muddy chunks of seagrass, it quickly dawned on me that I didn't love marine biology. I loved fishing. So it wasn't long until I switched my majors to political science and religious studies. However, rather than become a marine biologist, I did the next best thing, which is to marry a marine biologist, Jen, who's a marine biologist. And then what did I do? Of course, I moved her out here to the desert. After graduating from college, I went to law school, where my best friend jokingly drew this picture of my thought process. I know it's gonna be a little hard to see, but this drawing consists of a pie chart of my brain with multiple small slivers. The first small sliver is ministry and religion. The second small sliver is baseball. And the third small sliver is Jen. There are a few small specks representing my friends throughout my brain. However, by far the biggest slice of the pie consisting of 95% of my total thought processes is captured by one word, fishing. Over the years, as I became a fly fishing guide, published magazine articles on fishing, and won the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish Master Angler Award, my obsession with fishing only grew. This Christmas, my same friend from law school bought me this wooden plaque. And on this little wooden plaque, it says, 
Fishing is not a matter of life or death. It's much more serious than that. It's good to keep these things to remember my priorities. I thought a lot about the words that fishing is not a matter of life or death. It's much more serious than that. As I read this morning's passage from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. John opens this morning's text with the disciples gathered at nightfall on the shore of Lake Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee. Peter then boldly tells the other disciples, I'm going fishing. And of course, as fishermen, what do they do? They join him. For the disciples this past week had been emotionally overwhelming. As they went from cheering crowds upon triumphantly entering Jerusalem to witnessing arguments between the Pharisees and Jesus in the temple and then to a Passover meal that ended in an unexpected betrayal and led to a mock trial, a jeering mob, and a bloody public execution of their best friend. By the end of the week, the disciples are overwhelmed, exhausted, and numb. Yet the emotional overload doesn't stop there. Since there's news of an empty tomb that has spread across the countryside and all kinds of rumors have begun that were only dispelled by resurrection appearances of Jesus that had to be seen in order to be believed. Think about it. The events of this one week would not, over, not only overwhelm and change the lives of the disciples forever, but these events would change the world and human history forever. Some scholars then think it's a bit odd that in the face of these world-altering events, the disciples go fishing. But isn't this how we humans often try to cope and respond to trauma? We want to return to our former life and to a sense of normalcy. Matter of fact, many combat veterans that I have worked with try to do this same thing, often believing that they can just jump back into their prior life after war. Unfortunately, the invisible wounds of war and trauma often make this transition much more difficult than expected. In leading veterans groups on fly fishing trips across northern New Mexico and into southern Colorado, we often use being on the river as a way to center, to slow down, to be present, and to create space for people to open up. Along these same lines, new VA studies show how the sound of water may help the brain recover from trauma. So it's no wonder that at the end of this crazy week, we find the disciples eager to get back on the water and return to normal. Thus, when Peter tells the disciples, I'm going fishing, what he really means is, I need to get to back to a place that makes sense to me. I need to get back to a world that I understand. I need to get back to a place where I have some sense of certainty and control and where all of this is even going. Let's be honest, most of us aren't that different from Peter. Since after a crazy week or difficult life events, many of us just wish that we could go back to the way things were. Back to when things made more sense. Back to when we had some sense of certainty and control. Like the disciples, this mindset becomes even more prevalent in the world when there's bigger world-altering events, such as 9-11, COVID, the war in Ukraine, or the massive dysfunction of the American political system. How many of us over the past few years have yearned to live in a world that makes more sense politically, socially, and economically? How many of us struggle in the face of the world's injustices to understand how all this craziness of the past few years somehow is to fit into God's larger plan. See, friends, most of us are a lot like Peter in that when the world gets overwhelming and crazy, there are times when we just want to retreat and hang up a gone fishing sign. Indeed, as we see from this story, it can be tough to know how to move forward or even where to go post-resurrection. Although the disciples were hoping to find respite in their old fishing routines, they instead find themselves more frustrated after a long night of catching nothing. As day breaks, the disciples are exhausted and beaten down. Peter lays naked on the boat, stunned. In failing to catch fish, John makes it clear to the disciples 
that they can't just go back to their old ways. For now they must come to terms with living their life post-crucifixion and resurrection. Indeed, John exposes a powerful truth. A powerful truth that shatters the illusion of denial to them and to us. That just because we wish things were back to normal doesn't make it so. (coughs) Yet it is precisely in this moment of confusion, denial, and despair that the disciples encounter the resurrected Jesus, whom none of them seem to recognize even though they have seen him twice prior. Calling them to cast their nets to the other side of the boat, the the, the desperate disciples obey and haul in a massive catch. The catch is so huge that the disciples see it as a miracle and instantly recognize that it is Jesus calling to them. With hope now resurrected, Jesus invites them to partake in a fish and bread breakfast reminiscent of the feeding of 5,000 there on the shoreline. Although viewed as a nice post-resurrection story, many scholars have no idea what to do with this story or even why it's in the Bible at all. In fact, many think that John or one of his followers actually later added this chapter to the end of John's gospel. They note that Jesus offers no new teachings over breakfast and argue that John should have ended with chapter chapter 20's words, and I quote, The signs are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. A nice, punchy, cogent, concise ending is what they say and where John should have ended his gospel. But the reality is that John's gospel doesn't end there. Matter of fact, every single ancient manuscript of John's gospel includes this chapter making it clear that this fishing story was incredibly important to the early Christian community and to the future of our church. So then, the real question is, why is this story so important? And what is it trying to teach us about how to live as Christians post-resurrection? To get at these questions, we must first learn to think like fishermen and look at why Jesus chose fishermen as the disciples in the first place. One thing I've learned as a fishing guide is that fishing is a lot like life. There's a lot going on above and below the surface. To put this in New Mexican terms, there is the Rio Riba, the upper river, or the surface of the water where you can see the currents and riffles, the eddies and rocks, and how the water moves along the surface and the bugs flying on overhead. Then there's the Rio Bajo, the river below, and what lies beneath the undercurrents and the surface that isn't apparent to the naked eye. The Rio Bajo contains the undercurrents that you can't see, but will sweep you off your feet. The backflows where the water is rough and rugged and white water on the surface, and yet calm underneath. And fish facing a certain direction to get oxygen, food, and avoid predators by hiding under cover. Bugs that live their entire lives below the surface except for that brief moment that you see them flying above the water to reproduce, die, and fall back to the surface of the water to have new bugs that live underwater. Whether you're on a river, a lake, or even the ocean, you must be able to read what's happening above and below the surface of the water to be a successful fisherman. Jesus knew this about the fishermen and knew that he needed people who could read what's happening on and below life's surfaces. So with this as our backdrop, let's look at what we know from the surface of this story. While the disciples are often portrayed as slow to learn or like bickering little children, they also had to be an entertaining group of people to travel with. They brought much needed fun and levity to otherwise serious ministry situations. For example, just look at what happens in today's text. After fishing all night long, somehow Peter ends up naked. We don't know how, we don't know why, we're not going there, it is what it is. So when John recognizes Jesus is on the shore, what does Peter do? He instantly jumps up, impetuously rushes to put on all his clothing, and then once he's fully clothed, jumps in the water and tries to swim to the shore. 
Comically, Peter is caught between his desire to greet Jesus with proper respect and his eagerness to be the first one on shore. The best part of all of this, though, is that the boat is only 100 yards from the shore. So just imagine Peter struggling to swim with all his clothes on and his tunic as the disciples just merely paddle on by. It's a ridiculous scene. A ridiculous scene that provides us two important reminders about practicing a life of faith after the resurrection. First, when faced with the world's seriousness, John reminds us that we must find humor in life and never lose our sense of joy or laughter no matter what the world throws at us. Second, as Father Richard Rohr points out, this story reminds us that a holiness that you can trust is someone who takes God very seriously, but not themselves seriously at all. I want to say that again. A holiness that you can trust is someone who takes God very seriously, but not themselves seriously at all. Clearly, John included this surface-level story of Peter as a reminder of Jesus' warnings to us religious people not to take ourselves too seriously or consider ourselves self-important. Now, with that said, that you would think that if you were going to start a religious transformation and renaissance, challenge the religious authorities of the day, upend the political systems of your time, you'd probably want to pick disciples who looked more like Bill with his robe and stole, or myself with our ro my robe and stole on, than more like this. <laughs> However, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, and that's why he picked the fishermen. He knew that fishermen knew how to operate within the systems that he was working with. And he asked them to continue fishing after a long night. In asking them to continue after fishing this, after this exhausting and long night, Jesus reminds his followers that in Christian discipleship, as in fishing, they must persevere beyond their failures and never lose hope, for success is only a cast away a truth that all good fishermen know. I can't tell you how many times I've told Jen, just one more cast, I'll be there in a second, and about 15 minutes later, one more cast, I know that fish is there. <laughs> Despite being overwhelmed by the world's challenges, John's message to us is clear, that we must not lose hope, nor must we be afraid to fail. By challenging them to cast on the other side of the boat, Jesus also reminds them that to be as successful as fishermen and to build up the future of the church, they and we must be adaptive, resilient, open to suggestions, and willing to try new things. Looking even deeper below the surface of the story, that is, that Rio Abajo level, by choosing fishermen, Jesus knew that he had to have leaders who could persevere against the corruption the attacks, and the oppression of the Roman Empire. As it turns out, the fishing industry was one of the most preyed upon industries in all of Rome. For example, the fishermen had to pay a heavy tax just to use the road to get their fish to the market in Magdala, the only market where they could legally sell fish. Think about this. Just to use the road to get the fish to the market, they paid a heavy tax. Magdala as in Mary Magdalene, was also an incredibly corrupt and problematic town where they had to sell their fish and where the fish had to be taxed, additional taxes, in order for them to be brought to market. But get this, they also had to pay corrupt officials extra money to be able to sell those fish in the market. And these officials would skim from their profits off the top. So they were taxed on the road, they were taxed at the market, and then the officials would take even more money off the top. Thus, under Rome, most fishermen had to fish longer hours and catch more fish just to break even. However, to make a profit, the craftiest of fishermen would either quickly pour up, pull up onto the shore to sell their fish before they could get taxed, or they developed underground networks of relationships 
to help them sell their fish. Obviously, these networks and the craftiness to maneuver around oppressive Roman systems became incredibly important during Jesus' life and in spreading the message of Christianity, which is, of course, the, the symbol that was used to evade Roman persecution by the early Christians was what? The symbol of the fish. Like I said, fishing is not a matter of life or death. It's much more serious than that. Along these same lines, at the time of Jesus, there were also 230 boats registered with Rome to fish the Sea of Galilee. It's a lot of boats. With so many fishermen overfishing the area just to break even, the Sea of Galilee became an unsustainable fishery and began to collapse. Hence why the huge catch of 153 fish was also considered an incredible miracle. In calling the disciples to instead become fishers of men, Jesus wisely created a new opportunity for them to use their fishing skills, their craftiness, and their relational networks to build a more sustainable and meaningful life. As Jesus graciously makes breakfast for the disciples with all enjoying a well-deserved meal, Jesus embodies the final truth that we must remember in practicing our Christian faith. Speaking to this truth, Norman MacLean, author of The River Runs Through It, says this about his Presbyterian minister father, who was also a fly fisherman. And I quote, My father was very sure about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace. And grace comes by art. And art does not come easy. See, my friends, Jesus does not need to offer more verbal teachings to his disciples at this point. But rather, Jesus embodies the lessons and simply reminds them of who God created them to be. And that to be successful in the art of Christian living, we must always remember to rely on God's grace and God's presence in our lives. Amen.